Rockstar Games, one of the greatest game developing companies of all time. Each game they come out with is better than the last. From the very first Grand Theft Auto back in 1998 to Red Dead Redemption 2 in 2018, all games in between are very well known. Nearly 25 years of greatness and in those 25 years they've completely changed the way games are made. Rockstar opened the door to free roaming gaming. Now they weren't the first company to introduce free roam. This happened back in 1975 when Tato's Western Gun was released. But no free roaming game of any time could compete with Grand Theft Auto 3. This set the standard for all open world titles. We would not have such masterpieces like Red Dead, Grand Theft Auto 5, Elden Ring and so on. So Rockstar created one of the most important games of all time. Surely they couldn't top that, right? Well, a year later, they arguably made an even better title, Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Although smaller in size, the story and setting made up for it. Along with that, the amazing soundtrack as well. Alright, fair enough. Two good games, nothing to get excited about, right? Two years later, they made the best game of the year. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas is the most sold PS2 game of all time. 17.33 million copies sold, beating out Gran Turismo 3 by 2.44 million copies. Now, if you think GTA 3 set the standard, multiply that by 10, because to this day, San Andreas is still considered to be one of the greatest games of all time. So yes, Rockstar are pretty good at what they do, but don't get me wrong, they've done some stupid shit as well. I'm looking at you GTA Online. You would think with all these absolute classics, we would be talking about one of them, but no we'll be talking about one of Rockstar's most underrated games. Even though it's underrated and not considered to be up there with the likes of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas and GTA 5, it still goes down to one of the best games ever. You ask anyone who has played this game, what do you think of it? They're more than likely say it's an unbelievable game. And if they don't say that, Oh fuck off! And you taking the fucking piss! Bully released on the 17th of October 2006 on the PS2 later released on the 360 and the Wii with better graphics, more content, and renamed Bully Scholarship Edition. So ladies and gentlemen, sit back and relax while I tell you all about my favourite game of all time. Jimmy Hopkins is a 15 year old kid who has been expelled from many schools he has attended. Along with that, his mom has gotten engaged for the fifth time she abandons Jimmy at Bullworth Academy, a fictional boarding school in a small town in New England, while she goes on yet another honeymoon. And here is where our story begins. You are introduced to Gary, who helps you get acquainted with Bullworth. Along the way we learn all about the school cliques, the different groups of characters scattered around the map. You've got the nerds, led by Ernest Jones, a scrawny kid who is very confident in himself for some reason. You can mainly find them in the library or at the Dragon's Wing comics. The bullies, who are led by Russell, a gigantic student who has been held back a few years because of his low intelligence. They hang around the parking lot outside the school and in the school itself. The preppies, who are led by Derby Harrington. They are a very rich and stuck up group of individuals who love to box and talk about each other. They are so rich that they have their own facilities in Bullworth. You'll usually find them at the Harrington House or an old Bullworth Vale. The Greasers, who are led by Johnny Vincent. This is a group of people who are always wearing black leather jackets, slicked up hair, riding bikes and can't seem to escape the 80s. You'll find them at the Auto Shop or New Coventry. The Jocks are led by Ted Thompson. These group of men are the most physical clique in the game. You will always see them wearing Bullworth sports gear. There's only one female in their group. You can find them at the gym or on the football field. And finally, the townies. You don't run into them until the end of the game. They are made up of past Bullworth students who have been expelled or dropped out. They are the most violent group in the game. Led by Edgar Munson, they only hang around the Blue Skies Industrial Park. These cliques shape the story. Once Jimmy finds out the hard way how horrible everyone at the school is, he begins to work his way up the social ladder, the only way he knows how, by beating up the leader of each group, starting with the bullies. Jimmy wouldn't have thought of any of this if it wasn't for his friend Gary, who planted the seed in his head. Gary hatches a plan to take over the school. Jimmy naively follows not knowing Gary's full plan. It's established very quickly that Gary was only using Jimmy for his own game. 
In the mix of all the confusion, Gary tricks Jimmy into fighting Russell. His plan massively backfires as Jimmy beats Russell in a fight in the sewers underneath the school. Once that's done, you get massive respect from the bullies. They no longer pick on you in school. Along with that, the school gates are open and you're able to venture out to Bulwark Town. Basically, before fighting anyone, you must first gain a little bit of respect from each group. The more they trust you, the closer you get to fighting the boss. So in between battles, you're basically just doing errands for them and stuff. Next is the preps. You enter into a boxing tournament where you beat up everyone, slowly making your way up to Derby Harrington. You first beat Biff in a boxing match, but after that, you must beat Derby Harrington in the boxing hall's bar. He sends his goons on you while he hides behind the bar, only rarely coming out. Next is the greasers. You fall in love with Lola while you try to help Johnny Vincent with his love problems. You first fight Norton Williams in an abandoned tenant building in New Coventry while collecting stuff for Lola. You then fight Johnny Vincent in the junkyard. Your friend Pete helps you by activating a magnetic crane to throw Johnny off his bike. You move on to the nerds and the jocks. You beat them both in the same chapter. You storm the school's observatory to take out Ernest. Since the nerds are not strong, they rely heavily on weapons they make, such as the spud gun, the bottle rocket launcher and the spud cannon. Once you beat Ernest, he helps you to beat the jocks by coming up with a master plan. You steal the mascot's outfit and pull pranks on the entire team, ranging from super gluing the benches, messing with the scoreboard and pissing in the water tank. You take on the whole football team by throwing balls with firecrackers inside of them. The main boss being Ted Thompson, but in all honesty, the mascot is the hardest boss battle in the entire game. Having united all the school cliques, the leaders convince Jimmy to spray paint the town hall to show everyone who he is. The townies don't like this and they set out revenge on the school. They harass all the cliques, leading them to blame the leader Jimmy. They all turn on him. Gary gets Jimmy expelled by creating lies about him. Jimmy gets Russell to help him take down the townies. You work your way up to the Blue Skies factory to reach Edgar Munson. Once you beat him, the townies help you get revenge on Gary. The whole school has lost order and everyone is fighting. You beat every clique leader again in the school once again and Gary finally reveals himself. You fight him at the top of the school roof. You both fall through the roof and into the principal's office. Mr. Kravosnitch hears everything and expels Gary. The final chapter is Endless Summer. This is where you can go back and do everything you've missed and that's the story of Bully. Like most Rockstar games, the game is only about 40 cent complete when you finish the story. You have so much more to do. A mistake people make when playing this game is not completing the classes while doing the campaign. Doing the classes will make the story so much more enjoyable. For example, doing the shop class gives you a bike just outside the classroom. Photography gives you a better camera. Geography shows where all the collectibles are. Chemistry gives you weapon drops. Gym helps you with combat and get you outfits as well. As you can see, all these things would assist you massively in the game. Doing it after finishing the campaign is useless. The same with the hobo missions. If you collect all the transitioners, you can learn new fighting moves. Again, it's useless after the story is over. There's a bike race in each part of the map. These are the equivalent to drag races in other GTA games. There's also a scooter you can win at the carnival games with tickets. You can unlock a go-kart by completing races, first in the carnival and then in the town. The kart spawns by the shop classroom. If you need more money, you can get a job delivering newspapers and mowing various lawns around the map. When fighting your way through each group, a new save point can be unlocked. You have the beach house, unlocked by winning a boxing tournament. Dragon Wing Comics, unlocked by getting a high score in a certain game. The Greasers Hangout, unlocked by fighting everyone in there. And the Townie Hangout, again, unlocked by beating everyone in there. You can save your game, sleep, get health, and restock on ammo at these places. Errands are available around the map. Random people come up to you asking for a favor. These can range from anything, from picking a locker to collecting crabs at sea for a restaurant. You get money as a reward. There is a lot to collect in this game. G and G cards are used mostly by nerds, but if you collect all of them, you unlock an elf costume. Blue rubber bands are scattered all over the map. Collecting all will unlock a new weapon that's in your inventory permanently. 
a big bouncy ball. When thrown, it bounces everywhere. Transitioners are collected to be used for the hobo missions. In the scholarship edition, you get a really shitty backstory into why you should be smashing guard and gnomes around the map. Basically, a midget is upset about them and wants you to destroy them. You get no backstory in the first edition. You unlock a gnome outfit. They're the main collectibles. There is other small ones. They only unlock some sort of clothing. Like I said, in the scholarship edition, if you complete all the geography classes, the collectibles show up on the map, making it so much easier to find them all. You have multiple clothing, hair and tattoo shops where you can customise Jimmy. All of this makes up the game. I was always fascinated by Bully. I was 6 when it first released, but only started to get interested when I was about 10 or 11. I used to play GTA Vice City at my friend's house when I was really young, and that's what got me into Rockstar games. I was never allowed to play any of these games at home because they were so violent. But I thought I'd have a chance with Bully, considering it was only rated 16 plus at the time. I'm sure Rockstar did this on purpose. The GTA games were always for a more mature audience. Now I'm not saying Bully is for kids, it's still a violent game just set in a school, but there's no killing, no blood, and no cursing. So obviously parents might look at this and say, okay, that's fair enough. I finally convinced my parents to get me the game when I was 15 years of age. It wasn't easy. My mom used to check reviews on the game and see if it was suitable for teenagers. Of course the game being called Bully didn't help my case. Doing favours for girls in exchange for a kiss, yeah, that definitely didn't help either. The mission where you have to take pictures of someone on the cheerleading team, I could have done without that. Or the mission where a teacher asks you to collect girls underwear. I am so lucky my mom didn't see that one. But once I got it, I couldn't stop playing it. I had 100% of the game within a week, but I just kept doing it over and over again. It was so much fun. Seeing that the game had different seasons made it feel so much more immersive. The map is absolutely nowhere near the size of San Andreas, but that's fair considering there's no cars, trains or planes to drive. All the characters are really memorable. They all have really distinct personalities. The cliques are so different from each other. The teachers are very well done as well. We can't have a bully review without talking about the music. I say this for a lot of games, but this game, no doubt, has the best music ever. No word of a lie. The amount of effort that went into the music alone is incredible. It's always playing. What I like about it is that it changes in every situation. Every click you fight has different music. Every mission has different music. Driving vehicles has different music. Certain locations have different music. Classes, mini games, the carnivals, shops, all have different music and I love it. When it transitions to whatever's happening on the screen is fantastic. I have to give credit to Sean Lee, the greatest video game composer of all time in my opinion. So that's all I have to say on Bully. There's been rumours of a second Bully game. These rumours have been around for about 13 years now. I'm usually all for a sequel to great games, but I think this one should just leave it. It's a masterpiece and it should be just left that way. I hope you all have a good day and I'll see you later. Goodbye.